Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, dig into it. Uh, let's talk about the deliverables for a moment. How many people now have a KNN that comfortably recognizes all 10 digits? Most hands up, not all hands up, that's okay. Uh, like I mentioned last week, you can continue on with deliverables 8, 9, and 10, even if your KNN is not working 100%. However, if you're still having fundamental issues with your, uh, with your KNN algorithm, please do come and see either the TA or myself during office hours uh, and we can get you, get you going. Speaking of office hours, I apologize. I'm gonna have to reschedule my office hours again this week. Uh, my, office hours on, my office hour on Thursday from 10 until 11, I have to cancel. I'm moving it to 10 to 11 after class today, Tuesday. So I'm assuming that if you can make my Thursday office hour, you can hopefully also make my office hour immediately after class today. The TA, Caitlin, is still having her regular office hours this week. All good? Okay, so uh, deliverable eight, let's talk about deliverable eight. Um, I'm happy to announce for those of you that are at Deliverable 8 now, you're over the hump. The deliverables are going to get shorter and more straightforward from here. What are you going to be doing this week? Uh, this week, you're going to be adding a database to your system. You're building an educational game. You're going to have more than one user that's using it. Some users are going to make more progress than others. You need to be able to tra track that progress for all of your users uh, from one interaction session to the next. This is not a database class. I am not a database expert, so we are gonna create the most hackiest possible database you can imagine. Uh, I promise not to spring any more Python libraries on you. How are you gonna create your database? You're gonna do so by creating a database that is a dictionary of dictionaries. Some of you have seen this trick before, pretty straightforward. Um, when you start up your code at the beginning of deliverable eight here in step 1A, you're gonna create a database and the curly brackets remind you that this is a, uh, a dictionary. Obviously at the beginning, it's uh, empty. When you, uh, finish, uh, when you finish your code and every once in a while, it will write out the database in a pickled file to your, uh, to your hard drive. So we're gonna save out uh, the database as a pickled file, no fancy formatting, very straightforward. Okay, so what is this dictionary gonna look like and how are we gonna develop it? When you run your code here, uh, your code is gonna start by asking for your name. When you type in uh, your name, it is going to store uh, that user as an entry in the database. Uh, sorry, in the dictionary, a dictionary is always a set of keys and a set of values. At the top level of your dictionary, the keys are going to be strings, which are the name of your users, and the value associated with that key is another dictionary. So your database is going to be a dictionary of dictionaries of dictionaries and so on, right? Okay, what might we want to store in the dictionary associated with an individual user. What's some information that might be useful here? How many numbers they've successfully signed? Notes. How many numbers they've, uh, how many digits they've correctly signed. So you can imagine putting in this dictionary down here a set of 10 key value pairs where each pair is associated with one of the 10 digits and the key is the digit itself three, for example, and the value is maybe a binary number, zero or one. They've signed that digit, uh, they've signed that digit successfully or not. Later on, you might replace that value, that binary value with yet another dictionary that includes information about how many times they've been shown that digit, the number of milliseconds it took until they finally signed that digit correctly, and so on. So in deliverable eight, we're going to suggest some of the high level structure for your, for your database, like for example, having individual entries for individual users, but how you structure your database at the lower levels, that's completely up to you. And that's gonna be part of you starting to take ownership now for your ASL educational game and deciding how to track your users and how to track your users' progress. 
pretty straightforward. Any questions about that? No? Okay. So back to our theme that we started last week on looking outward. Uh, as I mentioned last week, one of the interesting things about HCI these days is we're usually not focused on website design. We're usually not focused on traditional computing platforms like desktops and laptops. We are in the process as a society of gradually threading more and more technology into the world where the technology is not sitting there passively like a laptop waiting for us to press a key or move a mouse. That technology is interacting in real time with the real world, other devices that are moving in and out of its field of view, and also interacting in more or less real time with people that are moving through that technology's field of view. That's what we mean by looking outward. How do we think about uh, human use cases, how do we think about designing useful and interactive technology when it's active technology? It is interacting in some ways like us with the physical environment. So a lot of our discussions over this week and next week are going to be sort of broadening our discussion of HCI. We started last time by broadening out along the social dimension. Most of what we've been talking about so far is thinking about one user at a time using a piece of technology. We might have many different kinds of users, but they're not interacting collectively and collaboratively together in an interesting way. Now when we start to think about crowdsourcing where we, we have a task that would be difficult or impossible for an individual to do, or it would be difficult or impossible for one user after another to do. We would like to try and organize large groups of people to work together. So we're thinking very carefully in crowdsourcing applications about social context. We are used to working in groups. Sometimes that works well, sometimes that doesn't work so well. How can we draw on and support positive social dynamics that lead to for example, finding DARPA's red balloons or some other uh, useful task. We'll switch, we'll finish that lecture today and move into tangible computing. So we'll now look, we'll broaden our discussion along the different sense organs that humans have. Most of what we've been focusing on so far is vis the visual sense, talking about graphical user interfaces. We'll talk today about TUIs or tangible user uh, interfaces. And then on Thursday and into next week, we'll start to look at some interesting applications that again bring people together in interesting ways and support them with technology so that they can do something that would be difficult or impossible for one user or a sequence, a sequence of users one after the other to do on their own. Okay, so we ended last time with the pyramid scheme uh, from MIT, which is to find the 10 red balloons. And in most of our discussion about crowdsourcing, the social context that we're thinking about is incentivization. Why should someone choose to participate in whatever crowdsourcing task uh, you put out there uh, on the web? There is one obvious way to incentivize them, which is to give them a cut of the winnings. But just offering somebody a cash prize for finding a red balloon isn't enough because the probability that they're going to succeed at that task is exceedingly low. So we looked at MIT's solution last time, which has become known as recursive incentivization. You're incentivizing somebody not to find the red balloon, but you're incentivizing people to think carefully about how to incentivize their friends. Right? You might reach out on your preferred social network and if you send out a blast on your social network with the right wording, that will incentivize your friends to maybe reach out on their preferred social network, which is different from yours. Right? We'd like to offload the useful work of not just finding the red balloons, but the incentivization strategy uh, itself. So the DARPA project was kind of interesting not just because it incentivized the construction of this particular crowdsourcing algorithm, but again, this idea of recursive incentivization. DARPA put out a large cash prize to crowdsource the construction of crowdsourcing algorithms. This was the winner. Okay. Some interest, if you go and have a look at the paper itself, there's some interesting plots out there. Uh, this shows three different groups of people. And 
the green circle that you see, the green node that you see in the center, that's the original person that found out about the red balloon challenge. And all of the outgoing edges from that green node reach out to all of their friends that they told about the red balloon challenge. And you'll notice that among the friends that they reached, some of those friends in turn reached out to their friends and working in these concentric rings out from the original person who found out about the challenge. In the bottom two trees here, uh, neither of these two groups found a red balloon, but in this case, this person down here actually found a red balloon, so they would have gotten $2,000. Their friend who told them about the red balloon challenge got $1,000, and the friend who told that friend about the challenge got 500, right? So we're having the cash prize all the way back to the original broadcaster. Okay, kind of an interesting thing to think about. We're gonna switch gears now. I'm gonna show you another crowdsourcing application, and this one is from my own research lab, and we wanted to solve a completely different problem. But again, this is a problem that would be difficult or impossible for one person to perform on their own. This is a robotics application, so let me tell you a little bit about the problem, and then I'll tell you about the crowdsourcing solution that we came up, to, came up with. As you're probably aware, in AI and robotics, it's very difficult to create a machine that can understand natural language commands. If you tell a robot, uh, if you tell an autonomous car, please take me from point A to point B as quickly as possible, it's a pretty vague command, and it's also fraught with danger because, of course, the shortest path between A and B might not necessarily be the safest path between point A and point B. So getting a robot or an AI or an autonomous car to understand natural language is still an open problem in both fields. There is a hypothesis out there about a way in which to solve this problem, and it's known as grounding symbols, or otherwise known as the symbol grounding problem. It's interesting in and of its own right. Just going to describe it briefly uh, for our purposes today. The symbols here refer to the symbols of natural language. Let's imagine that we had a simple uh, robot, and we, asked, we issued that robot a single natural language command, the command jump. The robot's never heard the word jump before. The robot doesn't speak English. All it hears is J-U-M-P, and the robot must act. But among the infinite ways in which the robot might act, how would it know which is the right set of actions that would cause it to actually leave the ground? In the absence of any other information, let's assume that the robot starts moving randomly. And every once in a while, just by moving randomly, all of its feet come off the ground. Assume that this robot has pressure sensors in the soles of its feet. So over time, suddenly it feels all of the pressure sensors on the feet register zero. All four feet have left the ground. And at just that moment, the crowd or the human observers say, thumbs up, you just did the right thing. You just J-U-M-P'd. The robot drops back to the ground, continues moving randomly, and again by chance it moves in another way that causes all four feet to come off the ground. It senses that repercussion of its action, and at the same time it gets this back from the human observers. If you endow that robot with a machine learning algorithm, that machine learning algorithm with enough data and enough time will start to learn that what JUMP means is when my pressure sensors drop to zero, my human handlers say thumbs up. That's what JUMP means. So the robot doesn't really understand JUMP to begin with. It's just an abstract symbol. It doesn't mean anything to the robot. But it could start to collect meaning. It could start to mean something to the robot if the robot can ground the symbols in the soil of its own sensor motor experience. If you ever spent any time around young kids or around pets, they will often do something and then stop and look at you, right? 
And they're sort of testing you to see, I just did something, do you care about what I did? Am I gonna get a thumbs up or a thumbs down for what I just did? So there is a theory out there that says this is the way that humans and animals also start to understand signals in the environment. In the case of animal, animals that can learn language, maybe this is how they start to understand these very abstract ideas like JUMP. Still just a hypothesis, not exactly clear how humans acquire language. It's an interesting hypothesis. And as you're going to see in a moment, we tried to, we created a crowdsourcing application to see if we could get the crowd to help our robots collectively ground language. So far, so good? Okay, so you could see, for even from this simple cartoon example, how this might work for a very uh, motoric command like J-U-M-P. So motoric, as you can guess from the name, means there are certain words in the English language that are sort of close to our muscles. There's a, there's a close one-to-one -one with a felt experience in the world, like decreasing pressure on the soles of our feet and the word itself. What about a slightly less motoric word or a more abstract word like movement? You can imagine the robot again performing lots of different actions and maybe the crowd issues the command walk, run, move, uh, move forward, move back, turn left, turn right. And in all those cases, the crowd gives very specific thumbs up and thumbs down for just jump, just walk, and just run. But if the crowd also issues movement, it also gives a th the crowd also gives a thumbs up for all of those cases, sort of an or condition. So perhaps the robot could recursively ground less motoric, more abstract words in more motoric words. Again, just a theory. And it's interesting to think about how far up the chain of abstract language you could actually go. Could we actually create a robot that someday is able to ground its understanding of political movement or socialism ultimately in its own felt experiences. Who knows? Let's take another political movement like democracy. That one seems pretty abstract. Anybody ever played tug of war? It kind of feels like democracy, right? You have two groups that are pulling in opposite directions. Okay, maybe some of these abstract words are a little bit more motoric than we might think. Okay, everybody clear on the problem? Okay, we're gonna try and get robots to actually perform this. So we're going to look at an application we've been working on for three years now in my lab. This is the Twitch Plays Robotics Project. How many of you know about Twitch? Most people these days, I think, right? Website where millions of people watch other people play video games. One person live streams uh, their monitor, or their game console to Twitch. So we've got a live video feed going out to Twitch and that live feed is then drawn in by one or more uh, observers. There is a uh, sub-community inside of Twitch called Twitch Plays, where it's not just the person playing the video game, it's now the crowd of observers that are collectively playing the video game. How does that work? Well, we again stream a, a live feed of a video game to the web, and we have a whole bunch of observers that are typing something into chat, and we take their collective chat and we treat that as a vote for what the game character should do next. And we send that collective vote back to the game console, which moves the character, which alters the flow of the game, which alters the video stream, which the observers see, they type something else in, and we have this big feedback loop like we saw at the beginning of the semester. That's Twitch Plays. What's Twitch Plays Robotics? So instead of streaming a video game, we stream our physics engine, this virtual environment. Inside this virtual environment is a relatively simple robot like you see on the left. And we have these two panels on the right which tell our users about what they're able to do. The top, in the top right panels, in the top right panel, users can vote on what command they want to try and teach the robot next. 
So we as the investigators don't choose jump or walk or run as the commands the robot should learn. We ask the crowd, what is, what is a symbol or a set of symbols that you think are groundable by the robots? We don't actually use that language because it's unlikely that the average Twitch user knows what the symbol grounding problem is. Instead, we provide some, uh, some uh, a tutorial for the users where we try and communicate to think about these robots as a pet. These robots can learn, uh, can learn a few things. There's probably a lot of things that they can't learn. The game, if you like, is what can the robots learn and how can we teach them those particular commands. So if you have a look on the right over here, this is a feed uh, of, all of uh, all of the chat coming in from the Twitch uh, observers. At this point in time, there were 28 people watching the stream. And you'll notice that uh, up here, two different users typed in crawl forward. So they're voting for that command. That's the command they think they might be able to teach the robots next. So far, so good? Okay, the current command that the robots have just heard is so close, which is a bit of a bug. Somebody typed in so close and nobody else voted for anything else, so that became the command that the robots heard. Let's skip ahead to something that's a little bit more interesting. There we go. So the robot is currently hearing W-A-L-K space F-O-R-W-A-R-D. Remember the robots don't speak English or understand any English. That's the command they hear, they hear, and in this particular case, this is how the violet robot is moving. Is the violet robot walking forward? Anybody feel that it's walking forward? Anybody feel it's not walking forward? Okay, so, You'll notice that in the bottom right, you can see that the crowd is currently voting for whether the robot is obeying the current command or not. At this point in time, four users have voted that the violet robot is not obeying the command walk forward, and one person just voted for the violet robot, yes, it is obeying the command walk forward. Questions? So, in my knowledge of like the original thing, I guess, like Quick Place Pokemon, there's just as many people trying to screw with the program as there are people trying uh, yes. to actually function properly. Absolutely. So, how does that balance out? That's a very good question. So, again, we need to think carefully about social context. And if we have a, a, a crowdsourcing application, in which the, incentivize, the incentive is not money, or possibly even in the case, especially in the case where the incentive is money, how we, do we distinguish between users that are using the system and trying to abuse the system? Very good question. So we could add some code on top of our crowdsourcing application here to detect those that are abusing the system and punish them in some way or block them if they are, uh, if they are abusing the system, which we could do. But again, let's think carefully about the social context. You're absolutely right. There are a lot of people on Twitch and the Twitch Plays community that don't necessarily play fair. Do we need to? Do we need to detect and punish cheaters or abusers in the system? Again, as you, you can tell by me posing the question, not necessarily. Why not? More likely to be outvoted. More likely to be outvoted. So you'll notice that when we created the ontology of Twitch Plays Robotics, when we decided what the basic con concepts would be in TPR, one of the fundamental concepts is voting. Right? So we spend a lot of time watching Twitch Plays Pokemon and other Twitch channels, and absolutely there are people that abuse the system. But generally speaking, it seemed there were more people that wanted to play honestly than dishonestly. So if you have to vote for everything, hopefully voting will cancel out uh, the cheaters, which as far as we can tell is usually the case. 
However, as always, humans are pretty adaptable. So when we first launched uh, the project back in 2016, uh, we had quite a few people playing. Most of them were honest, a few of them were dishonest. A couple of very enterprising, dishonest players uh, typed into chat, and good thing they typed it into chat because we collect everything from chat. They said, this looks like some sort of science project, so let's try and outwit the scientists. <laughs> they probably are only watching the stream during the day, so all of you that want to break Twitch Plays Robotics, come back at 11 p.m. <laughs> and we'll see what we can do. In the meantime, they said, we've created a, a post in, in some subreddit Go read the subreddit about how we're going to break TPR. Read the instructions carefully and come back at 11 p.m. So the abusers were in the minority, but they were organized. They clearly understood what we were trying to do because in the, in the Reddit post, they said, here are four commands that we would like to teach the robots. And you can imagine what those four words were. They were four words that you probably wouldn't use in polite company. They said, in the first of the four words, we're going to issue that command, and if the robot actually moves in front of the red line, give a thumbs up, give a yes. If it doesn't cross the red line, give a thumbs down. So they were trying to formulate this bad word was going to be a synonym for forward. The second bad word, whenever we type that in collectively, whenever the robot goes behind the red line, thumbs up otherwise thumbs down, so the second bad word was going to be backwards and so on. So they were not only going to try and teach the robot bad words, but they were going to collectively try and make sure that the robot successfully grounded those bad words in sensor motor experience, right? Perfect. This is exactly what we wanted people to do with exactly the words we would prefer them not to use, right? Not surprisingly. The twist to the story was the good guys and girls saw that chat message and they also said, hey, come back at 11 p.m. And whenever you see anybody from this list of usernames, give a thumbs up, give the opposite. So the good guys and girls came up with a counter strategy to try and undo whatever the bad guys and girls uh, did. I think in the end it ended up being a tie, but sort of an interesting uh, social science experiment on top of Twitch Plays robotics. So not surprisingly, it gets very complicated. Question? Um, I think I remember actually you lectured about this before. I have but talked about this before. Right. Didn't people start giving it really abstract commands? Uh, like yes. Yourself? Exactly. So you, if you watch the stream on the right, you can see all the proposals about commands. One of the interesting things is the crowd generally converges on motoric words, walk forward. If, you, if we put a random brain inside this robot that causes it to move randomly, half the time it's going to move in front of the line and half the time it's going to stay behind the line. So half the time the crowd is giving thumbs up and half the time the crowd is giving thumbs down. As you know from your KNN algorithm and other machine learning algorithms that you've worked with, you need samples from both groups. So in this case, there's just two classes, thumbs up and thumbs down. If you had all thumbs up, it would be impossible to learn that command. If somebody issued the command, be yourself, maybe that one's ambiguous. But you can imagine a lot of commands where it's a unanimous thumbs down all the time, right? So the crowd actually, the experiment was a success in that without us having to tell the crowd what motoric commands are and please bias your choices towards motoric commands, the crowd instinctually focused on those commands. However, as you mentioned, sometimes the crowd would issue more abstract commands like be yourself. Is this robot being itself? I don't know, that one's kind of ambiguous. Could you do a replace command so even if they were going to play with whatever words they want to to do things, they're still teaching it to do something. Couldn't you just say this word replaced with that word and now hey, thanks a lot, you just helped us learn something new anyway? If we replaced, if we as the investigators replaced a command that the crowd issued? Right. So if you said, okay, this word is also going to mean forward. Yes. So now everything's now reinforcing it exactly. We, we could do that. So then they can still have their bond at the same time, but they're still being retorted. 
Possibly. So again, we could keep adding on mechanisms where we replace words or group words together. These words all collectively mean forward and so on. What we tried to do again is pay careful attention to the social dynamics and the incentive and the incentives built into TPR, where we push the cognitive effort back onto the crowd, right? We would like them to do most of the work rather than us having to be the policemen and women where we're looking for cheaters and punishing them, where we're looking for commands and grouping them together or replacing them. Can we incentivize the crowd to do so? How successful was this actually? If you look at things like Bixby, that thing was garbage and they did the exact same thing asking you, hey, did I do the right thing? Exactly. Stop using it after a week, so it was just sports. How successful was this? We'll look at some data, we'll look at some data in a moment. For now, we're focusing on the HCI side of TPR. This is unlike the Red Balloon Challenge because there is no cash prize. We've been running this on and off for about three years, and I think we're up to about five or 6,000 users at this point. Why would someone bother playing TPR? What's the incentive here? I'd say it's like So there's, a, there's clearly some ideological slant to this, right? Assuming that you play the game fairly, I'm trying to help forward science or create useful technology. I think there, there are a lot of people who are sort of fascinated by robotics and machine learning that don't necessarily have the expertise to actually do it themselves. So watching something like this sort of unfold in real time can be really interesting for a lot of people. Right, so for some people it's interesting, they want to get into robotics and AI and machine learning, um, but they, they're not quite there yet, so this is sort of an entryway to that. We talked about uh, cognitive pleasure, um, sometimes even if something is difficult, and depending on the command and the robot, TPR can be sort of cognitively challenging. People seem to enjoy that, the robots are getting better, I'm helping, I'm contributing. So there's sort of an ideological, educational, cognitive Incentive, incentives going on here for some members of the, of the crowd. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, so how does this actually work? Again, remember that we're designing this in a way to try and incentivize, uh, to incentivize the crowd to play and play fairly. I think at this point I will maximize things so we can see this a little bit better. I'm going to walk you through what's going on under the hood in TPR. As you just saw, we have a master program which is simulating a whole bunch of robots in a physics engine, and then we are live streaming that simulation uh, to Twitch. And in Twitch, the crowd is typing in commands, and we collect those commands back from Twitch, and we store that in our database, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we have this continuous feedback loop between broadcasting robots and their behaviors and capturing the crowd's response to the robot's behavior. I'm going to walk you through this experiment by breaking it down into four different phases. So in phase one, the robots are simply acting. We're going to take uh, a brain, a random brain, and drop it into the robot. The brain is a neural network. We're not going to talk too much about neural, uh, neural controllers of these robots. We drop a brain into the robot that causes it to act randomly in response to a given command, and the crowd then votes. Three up votes, one down vote. 17 up votes, three down votes. Zero up votes, zero down votes. Next robot, next robot, next robot, and so on. Okay, we then, as this, as this process is running continuously, 24 seven, we start to build up a database and we can observe and then start, the robots can start to learn from that data using machine learning. What is that data set that we're collecting? Well, we'll go back to the video in a moment, but in the video, or in this particular deployment of Twitch Plays Robotics, there were just two robots, R0 and R1. R0 was the simple worm robot that you saw, and R1 is a simple four-legged robot. So they're slightly different uh, robots. For each one of those robots, um, every five minutes, we, the crowd issues a new command. So the crowd is voting on what command to issue the robot next, and at five minute increments, we take the most popular voted command over the last five minutes, and we post that to the robots, and the robots hear that command for the next five minutes, 
next command, next command, next command. So we build up a set of uh, commands, C, I, J. So command J issued to robot I. You can imagine this as a two by N matrix, if you like, where the two rows correspond to the two robots, and each column corresponds to the unique commands that those robots have heard. During each five minute interval, when the robots were hearing command C, I, J, every 30 seconds we created a random brain and dropped it into the robot. After 30 seconds, we pulled the brain back out of the robot, reset the robot, dropped in the next random brain for another 30 seconds, and so on and so forth. So if we do that every 30 seconds for a single command, that's issued for five minutes, we get through six random brains, which we're gonna to refer to as N, uh, which is our controllers. So we now have N, I, J, K. If we talk about N, I, J, K, we're talking about the kth controller that was dropped into robot I when it heard command J. So far, so good? Okay, let's have a look at N, I, J, K here. So during this 30 second period in which N I J, in which brain N I J K was controlling robot I under command J, assuming that there were users on the stream at that time, and assuming that the users were typing in positive and negative votes, yeses and nos, we start to collect S I J K zero. That's the number of down votes we got for for brain NIJK, and we also collect positive votes, yeses, which are stored in SIJK1. So S, the S's are simply integers, which are the number of either upvotes or downvotes collected for controller K running under command J on robot I. That's the data that we have. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna show you the same stream but sped up a little bit so you get a little bit of an idea of how this operates. So there's R0, there's R1. We've just issued the command walk, walk forward in the bottom right and every 30 seconds we're dropping a new random brain into the robot and collecting zero or more yes votes from the crowd or zero or more no votes from the crowd against that controller. All good? Okay, so now that we start to collect all this data, the question is, are the robots able to learn anything given this data? Of course, they're issuing lots of commands, uh, they think they're funny, they're issuing bad words. They're voting yes when they really think it's no and vice versa. There's a lot of noise in this data set that we're collecting, obviously. Can we learn anything from this? Somebody also issued an SQL insertion attack up here for those of you that are interested in that kind of thing. Uh, didn't work, happy to say. Okay. Okay, here's a snapshot of the actual data that we collected. In this first deployment back in 2016, uh, over, I think it was about a two week period, we, have four, we had only 424 people play. As I mentioned, we've had several thousand uh, since. If you go Google Twitch Plays Robotics, as of this morning, it was still running, so you can go try it uh, yourself. We had 424 people uh, play, and over that two week period, there were over 57,000 random brains dropped into the robots. But among those 57,000, there were only people on the stream during 6,388 of them. So the crowd typed something in. We captured at least one upvote or one downvote for 6,388 of those robot brains. All Question. the other ones were just kind of spinning in there. They're just spinning there. You know, if a robot moves in a forest, does anybody hear? The robots did something, but either no one was on the stream or no one said anything, so it's not useful for us. Um, were the robots all initialized at like the same point in development? Like 
Yes. So at at the beginning of each thirty second eval every every thirty second evaluation, we reset the robot to zero zero zero. It started from scratch, so there was no uh, no momentum. Nothing carried over from the previous evaluation into the current one. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So during that two week period, we collected over sixteen thousand pieces of chat from the crowd. As you just saw, there's a whole bunch of noise in that chat. But if we filtered that out, we found that the crowd tried to issue uh, almost 9,000 commands to the robots. Most of those commands were repeats. So someone would type in walk forward, then someone else would type in walk forward, someone else would type in walk forward. And once we filtered that down, there were, over, there were 266 unique commands that the crowd tried to teach the robot. Uh, we, filter, or we, we ordered these by most common to most rare. So in the cartoon example that we started with, I picked J-U-M-P for a reason. That was the command that the crowd issued most often to the robots, and they issued it to the robots 385 times. Okay, here's the top five. As you'll notice, most of these are very motoric commands. They're also short. No one said walk forward three body lengths, turn around 180 degrees, and then walk back. That was pretty rare. The crowd tended to focus on short motoric commands. Uh, you can actually go check out the paper and, and see the full list of these commands in the appendix. It's a very long list. As I mentioned, some of them in there are kind of interesting, like be yourself. Somebody issued solve for Matt's last theorem. Robots haven't quite done that yet. Look at the camera. That was another one. It's kind of interesting. Possibly that one could be grounded by the robots. Possibly not. Those are the commands. What about yes votes and no votes? Well, we collected 7,500 uh, 7, of them. And this number here, O, is the proportion of positive reinforcement or proportion of yeses. So 28% of the time, the crowd was giving an up vote, and 72% of the time, the crowd was giving a no vote. Not surprisingly, if we remember that the robots were being controlled by random brains, which means they were moving more or less randomly, it's unlikely that they were going to obey a lot of the commands. OK, that's the data that we collected. Let's switch to uh, the third part, third part now, which is learn. Are the robots actually able to ground any of these commands? Well, we started by asking whether the robots would be able to ground the most common command that was issued by the crowd, which is jump. So we went back through all the random brains that were run on the robots uh, during the command jump. We collected all of those. And for each of those uh, random brains that was controlling the robot under the command jump, we threw away any that received no votes. So we only kept controllers that were executed under the command jump and collected at least one upvote or downvote from the crowd. We filtered it down. That's the data set we're going to work with. So far, so good? OK. We then took each of those random brains and offline, not on the stream, we reran it on the robot. and. In the case of the worm that you see here, the worm is made up of three segments. Each one of these segments has one touch sensor in it. So the robot could feel when one or more of its three segments came into contact with the ground while it was being controlled by that one random brain. And that produced this matrix that you see here. I apologize that it's so small. But you should be able to see that there are three columns that correspond to the three touch sensors. And each row corresponds to about a tenth of a second during that 30 second evaluation period. And the entry in the matrix zero or one, that segment was in contact with the ground during that time interval or not. So the matrix is capturing the sensory experience of the robot. We then take that matrix and we compute that for each of the random controllers. 
executed under the command jump that received at least one uh, upvote or downvote. We took all the upvotes and downvotes and we normalized it into this value O i j k. So we have controller n i j k, which produced O i j k, which is the ratio of uh, upvotes to downvotes. So far, so good? OK, so being good HCI students, let's visualize the data first before we try and do any learning. So for, we're going to start with just the worm robot. Each green circle here corresponds to one of these random controllers. And the horizontal position of that green dot represents the proportion of time that the robot spent on the ground. So if all three segments came off the ground, that would be subtracted from this. So for example, if we look at this point in the upper right, this robot spent 95% of that 30 second time interval uh, on the ground. This very energetic random controller caused the worm robot to spend less than half the time on the ground during that 30 second interval. The height of the point indicates the crowd's response to that action. An O value of minus one means unanimous negative reinforcement. One down vote, zero up votes. 10 down votes, zero up votes. 13 down votes, zero up votes. An O value of one means all up votes, no down votes. An O of zero means Two upvotes, two downvotes, 17 upvotes, 17 downvotes, a split, a split vote. Okay, and everything in between. That's the data that we have. Is this data useful? Can the robot actually learn something from this? We started by doing linear regression. You can think of this as a machine learning algorithm if you want. Very simple. It's like KNN. Uh, but different in the sense that we're going to, we're not dealing with discrete bins like four iris, four, uh, three species of iris or 10 gestures. Now we have a continuous value that we're trying to predict, which is O. What we're going to try and uh, get our, lin our linear regression model here to do is to tell us if we know the proportion of time that the robot spent on the ground, according to that matrix, what was the crowd's likely response to that behavior? How, do we, how does linear regression work? Well, we take a straight line and we try and fit that straight line in the plane so that straight line is as close to all the dots as possible. As you can see, that's a very difficult thing to do. There is no real straight line that will go very close to all the points. It's not great, but it turns out that this is the line that is closest to the points. What can you tell me about this linearly regressed line? That line is the model that linear regression gives us back. What does it tell us about the relationship between proportion of time on the ground and the crowd response? Uh, there are more data on the um, down right side and uh, more data on Exactly. So if you sort of eyeball this, there's more data to the lower right and more data to the upper left than there is in the other two corners. It's not perfect. The data is spread out quite a bit, but it kind of makes sense. It's not a very good fit, but it is a fit that we can trust. And there's some statistics that goes into that that we're not going to talk about here. But generally speaking, this linearly regressed line tells us that the more time the robot spends on the, crowd, on the ground, the more down votes you can expect from the crowd. Did you um, have a question? Yeah, I hope I'm not getting ahead of, my, or ahead of yourself. That's all right. This, but did, did you do a visualization where the size of the dot is represented of the number of votes? Ah, that's a, good, that's a good question. We're actually throwing away that information. So right. one up vote and one down vote is equally weighted as 17 up votes and 17 down votes. So, obviously, I don't know this, but I'm guessing that the line at the top at one and the line at the bottom at negative one are probably 
very few votes because it would be unanimous and the ones in the middle are probably more. Could be. So maybe a little more reliable. I think that's a good that's a good idea, which might if we weighted these points by the total number of votes, we could incorporate that into our model here and the line might move a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we found for the worm robot. Here's the legged robot. This one has, as you can see, four legs, one touch sensor in each of the four legs, which means that matrix has four columns. But again, we ask the same question. Can we linearly regress this data on all the random brains that were run on our quadruped here? And is there a relationship between the proportion of time that this robot spent on the ground and the response from the crowd? And we also get back a line that has a negative slope. The more time that the robot spends on the ground, the more down votes we can expect. Which, again, is something intuitively we would expect to see in this case. If we go back and forth between these two plots, you'll notice that the slope of these two lines is more or less the same, but the y-intercept is different. What is, why is that interesting? What does that tell us? Sorry? No, there was no discernible difference between the number of people on, uh, on the stream for either robot. The ones with legs spent more time on the ground? The ones with legs spent more time on the ground, they're made up of more pieces. It's actually harder for them to get off uh, the ground. If we were to ask these robots what J-U-M-P means, one answer that these robots could give us back is the line. That's what J-U-M-P means. The more time I spend on the ground, the less the crowd likes it. But these two different robots would give us back two slightly different answers. They give us back these two different linearly regressed models which is kind of interesting from a robotics point of view. It means that the word J-U-M-P means something slightly different to both robots. At the highest level, they would agree, the more time I spend on the ground, the more down votes, but they disagree in the amount of, of that. Kind of an interesting result. Again, maybe not so relevant for our discussion today. What's also interesting, now that we have this model, we can use it to make predictions for things that haven't yet happened, very much like you're gonna use your K and N model to make predictions when a new user gestures over your device. Let's imagine that we dropped a random brain into this robot, and it was a very energetic brain. It caused the quadruped to spend half the time off the ground. What does the model predict the crowd will do in response? Imagine we animated the robot with this controller, but there is no crowd. We, we ask the model, how do you think the crowd would respond if the crowd was here? Yep. Vote somewhere around positive 0.5. Around positive 0.5. So if we continue this line, where it intersects the vertical line, that's the prediction, right? So. This model would tell us, we, I'm not quite sure what the crowd would do, but generally I'm going to predict that the crowd would give more upvotes than downvotes. Right? Part of the reason why we did this is, again, that now this robot can think before it acts. The robot could simulate itself, like the evil starfish did that we saw a few weeks back, and it said, I was just asked to J-U-M-P, and I'm thinking about doing this action in response, and it simulates it internally, and it says, okay, if I did that, I'd spend half the time on the, on the ground. If I actually performed that action in reality, and there were humans nearby to observe what I did, would they be happy with that action or not happy with that action? Okay. Okay, so again, a little bit of robotics but trying to use an HCI solution to this. If we want to create robots that act alongside humans in the real world, we need to make sure not only that they obey commands, but they obey commands in the way that human observers in retrospect would agree with the robot's response to that action. 
One of the aspects that's holding back autonomous cars and drones and other robots working in close proximity to humans is it's very difficult to prove beforehand that the robot will perform correctly and safely around humans. Our approach to solving the AI safety problem is to crowdsource it. If enough people train these machines, and if these machines can eventually predict, if I, if I hear this command and I act in this way, I'm confident that after the fact, humans will retroactively agree with what I did, that's a safe machine. We're a long way from getting there, but this is sort of our approach to that problem. OK, any questions about crowdsourcing and Twitch Plays Robotics before we move on? Uh, is that same stuff which Google collects data about, so we are the source of the crowdsourcing? So of course, right? There are a lot of big corporations out there that use us as data sources and collect observations from us. And some of that is trying to be used for machine learning. One of the differences with Twitch Plays Robotics is that the crowd is actively participating. We tried to create an interface where it's clear to the users, and maybe it's not clear in this version of it, but hopefully in a future one, that they are contributing. They are making the robots safer based on their participation in it. Right? The, the users are not passively doing something else, and someone or something is collecting data from them. They are actively. We are trying to incentivize them to actively train these robots to be obedient, safe, entertaining, what have you. What's, what's the goal? Are you trying to make a better machine learning algorithm, or are you just trying to beat your head against the wall until a robot figures out what you're supposed to do? We are, there's multiple goals. The first one is, can the crowd teach robots? And the answer is yes, at least for the command J-U-M-P. Next question is, how many commands can the crowd teach robots in this way? Third question is, once the crowd does teach them, are they safe? Can the robots formulate new actions that no humans have seen before? And if we have a prediction from the model and we show that action on Twitch, the crowd says, yes, that was the right thing to do given that command and given the robot's circumstances. Could this pave a path towards AI safety? OK, I think that's enough about TPR for now. Let's switch gears. We talked a little bit about crowdsourcing, where we're thinking very carefully about social context. What are the various ways in which people could use or abuse the system? How can we incentivize people to want to do this? How can we incentivize them to work well together, and so on? We're now going to switch and talk about tangible computing. We've seen this before. OK, so we've spoken mostly in this class about graphical user interfaces and the human visual system, because humans are primarily visual creatures. Um, one of the uh, unsung of our five sense organs is touch. So we're going to talk a little bit now about touch and tactile perception. As I mentioned last week, in this and the next lecture, we're going to distinguish between sensation and perception. The, di the main difference for us is that sensation is passive. As long as your eyes are open, photons fall on your retina. As long as you're moving about in the world, there are things that come into contact with your skin and your peripheral nervous system, your nerve endings cannot help but to register touch, pressure, uh, heat, uh, wind direction, and so on. We then, your brain then takes that raw sensation and tries to impose meaning on it, right? That's the active part. If I come into contact with an object, and my brain is not sure about what I'm touching, it, I can actively move against the surface and extract more information about that, that object. Okay. In the history of computing, most of, uh, most of touch has relied on our input devices. We use our hands to get information into the computer. There's a growing number of tactile user interfaces that are providing output to our, uh, to our hands. Why? Why is that useful? Why not just show everything through the screen or send everything through the speakers and project to our auditory system? Why give physical feedback back to the user? It's another uh, input channel. So sometimes you, your eyes cannot work properly, so oh. you can use your hands. 
Absolutely. So one useful reason for broadening this interaction with technology is sometimes one uh, sense organ is not working very well. For example, if we're creating uh, technology for the blind, or perhaps I'm looking at something else and I, I, you, we need to project something to another uh, sensory system. What information is more useful to send to, tacti to touch than to vision? assuming that I can see and feel perfectly fine. Why would you choose tactile feedback over visual feedback? What are some applications where that might be useful? For prosthetics, um, you know, if you're making, uh, you could use tactics for force. Okay. Um, there's a, a video of the, I can't remember the name of it, but the, there's a gentleman who got a prosthetic arm and um, there's a difference between kids holding an egg versus holding like a book. Absolutely, right? So if we're talking about uh, uh, robot prosthetics, which we'll talk about towards the end of the class, I can see my prosthetic hand reaching out and grabbing the egg. And you can try this by putting on very thick gloves and turning off your tactile sense. It's an extremely difficult thing to do, right? So we have decades of experience of watching our hands reach out into the world and physically manipulate objects. We get visual feedback at the same time as we're getting tactile feedback. And for most tactile tasks, we're often relying on both. Okay, so let's have a look at a few uh, examples of this. Pay attention to the technology here, but also what are the potential use cases for this technology? Okay, you can watch the rest of this video at your leisure. I think you get the idea. Let's start with where is the tactile feedback? We're, we're talking about output devices which are projecting feedback back to our tactile sense. Where is that in this application? Is this, does this exist in this application? It's visual with a virtual touch. <laughs> it's right, so that you're seeing the response of your actions, but you're, the user is not feeling the action. But in a few of the segments here, there was someone who was getting tactile feedback. Who was it? The object. The object, yeah, absolutely. But the ball doesn't have any tactile sense. 
But there was something that was on the board that does. The phone, possibly. Yeah, exactly. The phone can register motion, right? So the accelerometer on the phone is registering the fact that it's moving. Yeah, that's a good point. What else is receiving tactile feedback from this device? Not the programmer, not the user. Uh, do you mean the controller? So when you control the media using a ball? So when you, when you when you were putting, the user was putting their hands under the device, they don't actually feel anything, right? They're not literally touching anything. Uh, in, the, in the later of the video, yep. so the, the screenshot, the user is uh, controlling the system using a ball. So it, exactly. Right, so who's the other, the other user who's actually in physical proximity to the moving pins display, they are getting tactile feedback from the ball, from the moving pins and from the moving pins that are being controlled by someone else, right? So the feedback loop, at least the interesting one here for our purposes, is the social feedback loop between an action by someone else and the tactile repercussion on the other user. Right? Kind of an interesting feedback loop here. I can explain something to you, I can show something to you, or we can collectively perform a task together even if I'm not physically present, right? Kind of interesting. Okay. So uh, this idea of tactile user interfaces, aside from just kind of the eye candy or the hand candy, if you like, of this, there are a whole other set of predictions and expectations we bring to bear when we are physically manipulating an object uh, in the physical uh, world. When we grasp an object in reality, we get a rich series of sensory repercussions. Like, for example, seeing it deform, that's one. What are some other visual and tactile responses when you manipulate an object? You can see whether it deforms, which tells you something about whether the object is hard or soft. Absolutely, you might hear something from the device. Maybe the, the thing is protesting. <laughs> what else? Maybe the temperature. Temperature. So there's some important information from certain objects that are difficult to see or difficult to hear that can only be registered through touch. Could be important depending on the application. There's a lot of them. You can detect temperature, texture, softness. Texture usually requires this active moving component, right? Manipulating our interaction with the object to extract more information from it. Uh, does it resist our grasping? We can tell something about the mass properties of the object. Does it separate from other objects that it's resting on? Is it connected to them? So lots of information we can pull out of an object beyond just passively observing it from uh, a distance. Most importantly, I think, is this idea of bringing our spatial intuitions to bear uh, on the object. If you've ever worked with CAD software and you're trying to design an object in three-dimensional space, it's very difficult with a mouse to rotate an object to the orientation, to a desired orientation. It would be wonderful in a CAD if you could just reach in, quote unquote, grab the object and rotate it in the way that you like. So I think there's a lot of potential applications for tangible, uh, tangible interfaces. Same thing with pens versus a stylus or drawing with a mouse. Let's have a look at a, a related application here. This is illuminating clay. Again, pay attention to the technology and then think about where this application could be useful. Illuminating clay allows users to simultaneously interact with both physical and computational representations of the landscape. Here we see two collaborators preparing a landscape model to be analyzed with the system. A Vivid 900 Minolta laser scanner allows the topography of the model to be captured at a rate of one hertz. A Mitsubishi LCD projector casts the results of the landscape analysis back onto the surfaces of the model. 
The work table comprises of a smooth white surface and a rotating platform onto which a landscape model is placed. We experimented with different types of landscape modeling materials. Plasticine with a ductile fibrous core allows the model to maintain the required topography. The area around the platform is illuminated with a library of analysis functions that can be selected at will. The remaining edges of the work surface are used to project cross sections of the model terrain. The scan cast mode projects analysis functions onto the model. These include variables such as slope variation and curvature, shadowing and solar radiation, water flow, and land erosion. The cut cast mode allows users to add surfaces for projection without affecting the simulation results. CAD cast allows the user to construct three-dimensional topographical models. This system allows any object from the user's work environment to be used as an input to the system without the need for tagging, tethering, or demarcation. The interface provides a simple means for three-dimensional display where the tangible immediacy of physical models can be combined with the dynamic capabilities of computational simulation. Okay, so let's talk about the feedback loop first. Who is acting and who is registering the sensory repercussions of those actions? Absolutely. So there's the camera overhead that is observing the clay and inferring the height contour of the clay and projecting that back down onto the surface. It's organized like a table, so multiple people can interact with the clay at the same time and they can co co collectively feel the deformations of the clay together. And then after the computer is observing, it's also projecting down and the humans observe that projection. Absolutely, right? So again, the humans in this case are receiving simultaneously, simultaneous visual and tactile response to what's going on with the clay. But that response or that repercussion is being augmented by the computer. It's difficult, depending on the lighting, to look at a complex surface and say something about its actual uh, topography. So the computer is augmenting that, the visual sense in this case. Okay, so obviously they were doing some sort of prototyping here. What might be some domains where this could be useful? Um, car designs. Car design, yeah. okay. Because you, you need to, when you um, model car surfaces, you need to know where the breaking points and the, uh, basically where the surfaces meet. Okay. Um, to figure out how smooth, or, and they have, a, what do they call this, the wind tunnels? Wind tunnel, exactly. Yes, Exactly. So if you're collaborate, if you have a collaborative team that's collectively designing a complex object like a car, there are a series of prototypes that you go through. And in the case of cars and planes, wind tunnels are, are an important step, but an expensive step. Could we push downstream, meaning earlier towards the brainstorming, the design stage, to work out some of the kinks before we actually get to building a prototype and testing it in a wind tunnel? Right? One of the uses of these kinds of technologies is, again, to simplify and accelerate the prototyping stages. OK, let's look at it one more. I think I missed one here. Ah, we'll save the ultra haptics for next time. This one's a little bit, takes a little bit to explain. We will introduce the actuated workbench. We'll see the video next time. The actuated workbench, as you're going to see in a moment, is different from the illuminated clay, different from the moving pins display you saw in the first application. In this case, there are going to be objects on top of this surface, on top of this workbench, where these objects can be moved by the computer using magnets underneath the surface or it can be moved by someone grasping the object and moving the object, or the human and the computer can collaboratively move an object together. We'll see the video next time, talk about potential applications. 
I have my office hours 10 to 11 a.m. after class today. I do not have my office hours after class on Thursday. Caitlin, the TA, has her regular office hour later this week. You're working on deliverable eight. We have a quiz due tonight, and I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks.